Hello, Jan. Welcome to Scouting for Growth. Hi, thanks a lot for having us and having me, uh, Sabine. Good to see you again. Good to see you. So, you know, on my podcast, I like giving a little bit of a background introduction uh, about the speaker. So, Jan, tell us who you are, you know, what makes you successful in life. But also I want to know, you know, the current, the, the recent fundraise, right? Around 3.4 million you raised with your team, USD million you raised with your team. How does it feel like in a market which is quite uncertain? And I know a lot of startups are struggling to get their fundraise right. So tell us, how is it for you? Yeah, I, I, long story short, it's an amazing feeling. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, pointing it out. But uh, let's start from the top. Um, so my name is Jan. I'm a CEO and co-founder of Autonomy. Um, I'm a French national. I grew up in Marseille, uh, went to grad school in Paris, studied computer science. So really, I'm a, I'm a nerd at heart, but I'm a financial engineer by trade. Uh, so right around 2003, and at that point, it was the kind of the onset of the internet bubble in, in the tech industry. Decided to redirect it myself towards financial services, and I moved to the U.S. I found a job in Wall Street in New York uh, in 2003, and essentially, I never left the U.S. So, I spent my, my entire career in uh, capital markets, risk management, and technology in the U.S., in New York specifically, um, at several financial institutions, brokerage firms. And from 2013 to 2020, I joined Citigroup in downtown Manhattan, um, you know, essentially wearing two hats. Number one, I was uh, the head um, risk manager for structured credit and emerging markets for uh, quite many years. But more interestingly, in 2017, with the uh, digital asset ramp up that we encountered, I got involved into uh, emerging tech, deep tech, and blockchain uh, within the City Ventures innovation arm. And I got incubated as a startup uh, within their innovation lab. So uh, that was a very interesting time, you know, to get started with the blockchain. I'm not maybe the earliest adopter in the in the space, but you know, in a, in retrospect, you know, five six years experience in the space now feels like almost decades in comparison to other in industries. And um, you know, I've been enjoying you know this path quite a bit at the intersect of you know traditional financial services, insurance, but also uh, new uh, technology applied for uh, decentralized finance and digital assets. Um, so what's been interesting uh, at my last experience and kind of explaining a little bit of my transition from the corporate world into more entrepreneurship, um, you know, what, what became very visible is, you know, a lot of the uh, operations, uh, pricing model and other procedures and processes in financial services became very obsolete and very uh, heavy handed in terms of uh, regulation. And there was a need for, you know, new, fresh, you know, product in the space. So I was working exactly on those uh, items, um, you know, while I was in, in, in innovation lab at the, at the Citigroup Ventures uh, entity, as I said. And while I was working there, I also came across a number of uh, deals in fintech, and InsurTech, uh, which was very exciting for me. I was looking at you know new product coming in from not only internally but also also externally, and that's where I came across the fascinating space of parametric insurance. So parametric insurance, you know, in very much layman term, they are the equivalent of those uh, financial derivatives or you know swaps or other very much you know binary products that you you see in financial markets into the insurance space um, so uh, parametric insurance for weather for instance you know you can actually automatically trigger uh, some policy based on temperature or other weather events what we're bringing with autonomy is a binary event contract uh, for the supply chain space right 
<clears throat> so um, before we get into like too much of the product, you know, description, I'm sure we'll we'll get to uh, more details. Um, you know, the recent event, as you said, was you know very very um, very productive on our end. Is uh, the fundraising announcement that came in uh, a couple of weeks ago? Um, you know, so we fundraised in 2021 uh, for our pre-seed or the f- first tranche of our seed round. It was uh, you know pre-product pre. Uh, pre-revenue and it was you know a pretty pretty interesting time to to raise last year uh we had you know pretty decent traction with you know uh, pre-seed vcs and angels and this year i was kind of expecting struggling you know tremendously uh considering the circumstances right the high inflation uh, rampant you know inflation trend that we saw uh the political climate that's been very much an an headwind for for everyone uh coming from uh, ukraine and russia uh, some other tensions coming from the uh, more east side of the of the of the globe and you would think that you know an early stage startup would be struggling you know uh enormously for 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 fundraising Turn out that you know our fundraising campaign was actually more productive this year, and um, I'm very glad that you know we managed to close it out in less than three months. Um, so yes, as you said, 3.4 million raised uh, these days. You know it's it's pretty solid. You know some people are struggling to raise even uh, any dollar or even cents. So you know we're very very grateful for it, and we're very uh, thankful for our investors, VCs, and supporter. Um, you know. Kind of helping us getting to the next stage. It's a uh, fantastic. Um, I just wanted to summarize, you know, the takeaways of this this experience in terms of fundraising. The turning point for us has been when we actually visited uh, Austin in Texas in person. Uh, we were in touch with a number of uh, venture capital uh, teams, you know, through Zoom, by email, and so forth. But the mere fact that we actually went. Uh, to this conference and uh, met them, you know, handshaking, grab a coffee, um, having this in-person chemistry in place actually created uh, much more interest. And they essentially sent us a term sheet literally like two weeks after. So that that kind of resulted into very much like the, uh, you know, tremendous difference from the pandemic, you know, two years where everything is on, was on Zoom and now the conferences started to reopen in person. People taking advantage to make sure you can uh, you can you know shake some hands and you know essentially have this in person contact that makes a tremendous difference for us. So that was the happy event of the, of the summer. Yeah, very very nice. Congratulations! And you mentioned that face to face engagement, which is I think crucial, right? We went to uh, the conference in Vegas. You went to Austin as well. There were a number of conferences, and I know some of your investors were as well um in vegas with us um and so how did you decide which investors you went for i mean give us some ratio did you talk to 100 investors to find your your top 10 yeah that's so that's um that's always interesting to uh you know come up after the fact and you know go for the celebration and congratulation uh while you know, it's been, you know, many years, you know, uh, relationship built with a number of them. Um, so th- the thing that's very interesting about our product, we are in the intersect of uh, three to four industry that are, you know, very much in screaming for a refresh and they are all advancing very fast throughout innovation. So obviously the first one is intratech, insurance technology. So the insurance sector is wanting to take the leap of faith now with a number of projects in the space, you know, uh, us included. Uh, the second one is supply chain, right? Supply chain, I don't need to kind of reiterate whatever happened in the aftermath of the pandemic. Uh, the uh, crisis that we are going through globally on the back of, you know, changing behaviors, the e-commerce, you know, booming across the globe when people were just like, you know, uh, anchoring down, you know, at home, doing nothing but actually ordering stuff on Amazon, uh, created a lot of the um, transparency about supply chain uh, dysfunctional processes and the, the scaring needs of uh, supply chain essentially adopting new technology. The, the the other two sectors are uh, financial services, fintech, so the payment side of things, but also uh, the uh, blockchain uh, areas, right? So having said all that, at the intersect of those four sectors, 
we managed to get a very uh, productive mix of investors backing us, uh, but not competing with each other, right? So that's kind of the uh, uh, the secret sauce in in, in our fundraise. We uh, we managed to convince you know every four facets of those industry uh, essentially being productively collaborating into uh, supporting us on the financial capital side of things, but also on the industry network, right? So VCs and investors are extremely helpful to bring fresh capital in the bank, but really if they don't bring their network and, you know, the business development opportunity, uh, it's, you know, generally a moot point. So for us, it was all about finding those partners in those buckets of sectors and risk that are very meaningful for us and move forward with uh, very productive conversations. That's super. So let's let's go into now the uh, business mo model of autonomy. So you already touched upon some key um, statement here. I mean, we know that in December 2021, right, Walker was at the center of a crisp shortage. Like, you know, in the UK, Walker scripts are everywhere, they're in every pub. And if there's a shortage, well, it's pure madness pretty much. And actually the cause was not uh, because of, you know, supply chain issues. It was actually because of a computer glitch uh, from um, head office PepsiCo. Mm -hmm. Then we read so much about uh, Apple and the iPhone, the iPad, the MacBook Pro. My husband tried to book one or to order one. It probably took three months for him to get the new, the new Mac actually. Again, because of supply chain constraints. And I think it's not going to stop because of the issue with the chips, right? Which goes into, into those computers. So your proposition is very timely uh, because we realize that there is so much dependency on specific countries, which are producing some of the parts we need from uh, for our technology. And so tell us a bit more how you start addressing this, um, not only, I guess, from a supply chain viewpoint, but your main focus is cargo, right? Cargo insurance as well, Jan. So tell us a bit more about the business model. Yeah, it's very, uh, very loaded question, but you know, certainly like a bunch of, uh, of my favorite topics. Uh, thanks a lot for asking. So I think the starting point for us, you know, as you said in 2021, is there was uh, quite a bit of rippling effect of uh, of the noises that we we heard from global supply chain breaking down. Uh, but, you know, for us, it was a little bit of uh, maybe a few months beforehand. There was two events that were very critical and instrumental. So the first one was the uh, snowstorm in Texas, uh, which was, I think, in one in a hundred years events, so to speak. So that, that has a lot of this climate and weather component that we talked in the parametric and that ripples down into transportation. And that created such a, a traumatic, you know, volatility in the market. Uh, it started to be very visible that, you know, uh, cargo players, uh, freight forwarders, logistics, uh, while, you know, being on the forefront of, of trying to like operate as fast as possible, they were constrained with huge amount of uh, financial liabilities that they couldn't recoup from any traditional insurance contract. The second aspect, the second event was uh, almost a few weeks later, uh, after February into March, was the Swiss Canal. You know, everybody, everybody's seen it. Everybody talked about it. It turned out that, you know, this um, blockage in Egypt actually turned out to be a, a returning effect, returning event over the years. Ever Given actually suffered three or four of those blockages, you know, across the globe. Uh, and this is, again, you know, uh, on the back of supply chain not so functioning properly and uh, insurance or financial contract not being uh, transparent enough in order to service those players in, in due time. So, you know, what came, you know, very, very interesting for us is not only the parametric aspect, so the binary event triggering of a potential delay interruption of supply chain, which we cover and we first to market in doing so, uh, but also the facilitation of operations and payments, right? So what's interest, interesting in this case is, um, you know, not only can you have any type of transparency about where your contract, your policy is, right? Uh, unfortunately, you know, I, I got to say like, you know, I, I know those uh, big insurance incumbents have great underwriters and big balance sheet, but, you know, in terms of processes, they're very outdated. 
But the second piece that's even more interesting and more uh, upsetting is uh, when you get approved for a client, which doesn't happen very often, quite uh, frankly, uh, you know, the next thing you know is that, you know, you have to wait for a check in the, in the mail and go to the bank yourself. So um, I'm being a little cliche here, but you know, I'm not too far from reality. Uh, and the response that we have here is kind of in integrating a full-blown fund management uh, infrastructure that's based on digital wallets, right? So we believe that uh, if we have if we have the right infrastructure to collect premium, uh, manage collaterals, and settle compensation payments within this uh, very much ring fence and consistent infrastructure for digital payments, then essentially we're going to be creating a very streamlined process. So this is exactly what we did. We don't want to ring fence the client-facing uh, payment solution, the collateral management, which is you know in the middle, and eventually the claim, which is also like a different entity in the traditional space. For us, is one single platform. Everything is operated in one single uh, unit, and that can be streamlined for both the clients, the operator, and the reinsurance car carriers on the back end. So one thing which I think is extremely interesting, though, is that uh, when you look at what you are doing is, you know, when we think about core systems in insurance, we see them in a very specific way. But what you are saying is that you can actually rebuild in ha in some ways the core system to fulfill the customer needs better. In In this case, is the risk manager within the supply chain environment cargo um, insurance frame, right? And what I heard again from what you just said is you are using the wallet as a mechanism to do that. And I wonder whether you can also help us understand, therefore, the difference between a hot wallet and a cold wallet. I assume what you are doing is probably more ring fans. I think it's probably called hot um, rather than what we have on our digital phone where we put our cryptocurrency potentially which is cold wallet so tell us a little bit more around that concept of wallet which come very much from a fintech background i think and probably starting coming into insurance too yeah no that's that's uh that's correct the, the way you describe it you know has brings a lot of value to the conversation um what i want to avoid is um getting in too much into this uh, crypto conversation so that uh you know potentially like insurance or supply chain uh actors might be like little scared or afraid um you know in order to just clarify the infrastructure that we integrated, uh, they're essentially like a ring fence, so a private uh, wallet infrastructure uh, that create the bridge between your bank accounts, your credit card, which is what we call fiat currency, you know, US dollar, GBP, euro, and whatnot, into our internal um, internal digital assets, which is essentially how we uh, manage the funds on an independent basis. And there's no uh, open market on the back end, right? So it's not like we're trading in and out some uh, cryptocurrency, not at all. Uh, we are managing uh, all internally, but we fast track and we create a very seamless way of uh, uh, transferring funds from a wallet to another. And and all that you know brings uh, a couple of values to the clients, but also the stakeholders, right? So that brings um, uh, transparency, right? So everybody knows at what point how much money was collected, how much money was uh, essentially collateralized for the amount of policy that we need to secure, and also how much compensation were, were paid out. Uh, so that goes along the clients, but also any intermediary in the in the process, such as let's say retail in, insurance brokers, they distribute our uh, policy and therefore they get remunerated through commissions. So that also is is very transparent. Every every stakeholder owns a wallet and they have the, the money immediately. The second piece is you know frictionless and speed, right? So because we are uh, essentially using this uh, this solution, we can transfer for um, you know funds for free between wallets. We don't have to pay transaction fee in and out, which is a, a big problem in the industry. And the third one is speed, right? So this is immediate transfer. You can get you know a snapshot day to day of how much premium was uh, collected how much compensation and reserve are being uh, topped up in order to make sure that, you know, everybody's is risk managed properly. Now, you know, beyond the, the wallet infrastructure, because you mentioned risk management, uh, I'm, I'm a 
you know, two decades risk manager by, by trade, as I said. Uh, for me, all of this automation uh, works pretty well and can be, you know, bringing a lot of value. And by the way, you know, a number of parametric insurance startups have been doing something similar in terms of automation of the triggers. What we're bringing on top of it is a full-blown uh, algorithmic uh, underwriting model and also the risk management framework for syndicates and uh, reinsurance on the back end, right? So what we want to bring is very much uh, end-to-end platform for operation and risk management. And with that, I essentially leverage, you know, those uh, 20 years of um, portfolio management experience and creating, uh, you know, hundreds of uh, limits in order to create a very, very comprehensive framework in order to operate, underwrite, but also uh, risk manage our, our assets. Yeah. So I remember when we talked, you mentioned that autonomy has also uh, an index, right? You are dealing with indices. Can you actually help us understand how this additional component works? Because I can see that from the image behind you, right? Live hair, cargo delay index. Tell us a little bit more about this as well. Yeah. So this um, index product that we uh, released earlier this year, uh, was also a pretty uh, interesting milestone that we achieved as a team. Um, so the Nasdaq, you know, Nasdaq is a is a stock exchange, but it's also uh, a technology firm, and, and they provide a number of uh, indices. Uh, I think there's a num- close to forty five thousand indices on their platform, uh, which they essentially distribute, make available, and also trade. Uh, with their uh, clients in financial services and otherwise, right? So they got very excited uh, by the fact that we're bringing uh, a new product for insurance and supply chain, but also because of the fact it's a blockchain powered uh, index, right? So the underlying of our index are a number of uh, small contracts that comprises into the portfolio. So we essentially uh, recreate uh, the U.S. cargo market into this uh, internal portfolio, and each of single asset is represented by a smart contract. So we operate smart contract within the platform. We take a weighted average of each single prices of those contracts, and we create an, a blended uh, index price. So that index price represents the U.S. cargo market for air freight. And that can be tracked on a day-to-day basis in real time. So you can look at it on our website uh, if you wish, but you can also check it in NASDAQ, Bloomberg, uh, MSN Money, and other platform. So we have very much a uh, global outreach on, on that perspective. So what that what that does is very much two things. The first one is bring awareness to a very large audience about the power and the quantitative you know extent of what we can build, bring to the market. So any type of commodities trader, uh, any type of reinsurance or insurance carriers or supply chain actors in the space can get access to the trend of the cargo market, right? So the price goes up, the uh, the cargo market uh, behave well, and the price goes down, then it's starting to suffer some disruptions in the space. So that's the way we actually build the index. The second piece is essentially for us to use also as a proxy pricing. Right, so we use our own index in order to price more sophisticated risk asset that we have in the book in order to make sure that you know if we don't have direct reads on certain uh, risk uh, because of maybe a liquidity reason, then we can default to our index, which is a generalized industry benchmark in this case. Superb. Right. Uh, really, really interesting. So tell us a bit more now around your customers because you are disrupting in some ways or reinventing the way we are doing cargo insurance and so it would be really helpful to understand how your buyer has been responding to your approach as to how you believe the world should be dealing with cargo insurance and supply chain risk in the future yeah so the the end buyers that we're approaching um are uh shippers uh, logistics company, 3PLs, 
and um, and freight forwarders, right? So there, a lot of them are third or third party or intermediary in the space for the supply chain to transport uh, containers, assets, and goods from A to B, right? Uh, that can be from you know A A to Z in this case, you know the full um, you know transportation chain or one portion of it, one leg, right? So th these are the uh, the end markets. And the distribution goes to a retail broker or other agencies in this case. Um, the response is, you know, it's very interesting. There's um, certainly like a lot of, um, I need that product yesterday, right? You know, especially in the, uh, in the light of what we just experienced the past two years. Uh, it seems like, you know, people think right away, uh, you know, February 2021, earlier this year, the holiday season last year anticipating this next holiday coming essentially now, right? Developing throughout, you know, Thanksgiving into Christmas, you know, people are just like, you know, scared about like the repeat of last year and any delay or interruption are going to be again, very costly for uh, the distributor, the shippers and the intermediaries in the space. So the freight force in between, because uh, everybody's like, you know, at the mercy of some uh, distribution or supply chain problem, right? And again, you know, unfortunately, the regular contract that they have in place are not going to be helping them recouping any money. Um, so in that case, they always tell me like, you know, I want that product yesterday, obviously. But the second thing is like, we hear a lot of, uh, or at time, at least uh, it's too good to be true, right? So because it seems like, why is it that, you know, my... Uh, you know, I don't want to name names, but, you know, your regular large carrier, uh, not capable of providing that kind of, uh, of uh, product or coverage. Well, reality, um, you know, what I explained right away is the traditional policy language excludes cargo delay altogether, which sounds like, you know, absolutely, you know, surprising to everyone, but it is the case. Um, and I think that stems from, um, a number of reasons. Number one, obviously, the historical set of language that we inherited from, you know, almost centuries from, you know, the Lloyd's syndicates market um, haven't changed that much, right? Uh, I think there's a lot of legacy language that's still sticking around and it's not too productive, but it is what it is. The second item of why we think that has been the case for so long, but now it's actually changing rapidly, is the advent of uh, certain uh, hardware and uh, sensors technology, right? More and more, the supply chain, marine cargo market is uh, equips, you know, their own ship, vessels, air freight, and uh, track, you know, tracking uh, devices with a lot of those sensors. So therefore, what you what you have is, you know, while it was completely opaque in the past, now you get trillion uh, amount of data in the market that tracks those containers uh, in real time or near time and gets create opportunity for parametric products to be arising for delay interruption, but also some other perils such as temperature rise for perishables or humidity change for some of the ags product or any type of fires, water damages, or any theft that can be arising. And that could be detected through computer vision or cameras, that kind of stuff. So that's new technology that been coming in the past decades and now become much more mature. And the beauty of parametric insurance is we are the essentially the receiving end of uh, this valuable data. We can organize and create underwriting model and essentially operate automatically on the back of it. Yeah, so that's super interesting. So one thing which I read um, from, I believe, one of your investors, actually, Yan, is, you know, the use of leading edge technology as part of what you guys are doing in the platform. And I saw, you know, for sure, this part around smart contracts, but also, so, you know, mention of chain links, uh, advanced risk analysis, and also Web3. And so how does it come into play when you start looking at your future roadmap at autonomy? No, it's a very interesting question. Um, I get the why blockchain question mark uh, quite a bit. Um, um, I think, you know, there's some personal convention, conviction, uh, but it doesn't have to be personal to be also convincing. So, um, you know, the way I put it when, you know, people ask me is very much four pillars of uh, blockchain technology. 
uh, that makes it, you know, such a compelling candidate for us to use. Uh, so number one is scalability. The second one is automation. Uh, number three is uh, digital payments. And number four is Web3 slash DeFi, decentralized finance, which is one of my favorite topics. So now if we want to drill down on those four pillars, uh, number one is scalability with Chainlink. You mentioned Chainlink. So Chainlink is uh, number one uh, API providers for uh, blockchain. So they're called oracles, right? So they are a, a type of services that connect the... Uh, outside world with the smart contract and they've done with encrypted and secured APIs. So it's very important for us to actually get a uh, real use case uh, implemented is to use uh, chaining oracles. So the second one is automation, right? So a smart, contra smart contract is now the representation of uh, a digital policy, right? So the policy and your claims are this one uh, digital entity called a smart contract, and they summarize the legal and economics um, of the of the terms, and they're being executed on a fully independent basis or autonomous basis, hence our name. Uh, number three, we talked about it uh, a few minutes ago, um, the advent of uh, digital wallets and automated fund management is something that's only uh, possible if you have a blockchain integration the way we do. And um, it's very important that you know we leverage the transactional layer of blockchain as much as possible. And that part is, uh, is vital. And number four, as I said, which is my favorite topic, is a little more forward thinking uh, that has a bit of a flavor of a North Star project overall. Uh, but at the same time, we or already have some evidence that, you know, sooner or later, we'll be actually creating more and more value on that aspect. So decentralized capital for to underwrite and back our policy is, you know, the future for us. I think there's definitely tremendous value in us, you know, using, you know, a variety of uh, capital investors. Uh, so capital market investors, but also crypto investors in order to form capital uh, outside of the traditional route in order to create more opportunity to underwrite new parametric products. So you, you already mentioned your expertise, I mean, depth of expertise, years of expertise in risk management, supply chain. Um, you know, what does it mean when you build a team? You know, how do you find the talent? You're already talking about the Web3, and I'm not sure there's enough Web3 people out there. So how do you build a high-performing team, and how do you find them? What are the new roles you have to create, actually, Ian? Yeah, so it turned out that um, team building or, you know, creating the, the right team for the right product is the biggest challenge, you know, that I've fa faced so far. You know, people say, you know, fundraising is the toughest or finding capacity with, you know, Lloyd's or uh, otherwise is, is tough. Um, everything is pretty tough. I, I agree with that. But writing, you know, finding the right uh, staff, the right, you know, team members, uh, the people you can trust in our core team, because you want to have someone that share your vision and that, you know, it's going to be moving, you know, as fast as you can. And also, uh, you know, kind of suffering through the uh, pick and troughs, but still like, you know, being resilient after, after all that uh, is very special. And, um, you know, it started with, you know, a bit of luck, you know, luck has been, you know, pretty present in my life, you know, I cannot deny it. So I got to recognize it and being grateful for it. Uh, um, our two, my two co-founders are tremendous uh, guys in the space. Uh, Sebastian uh, come from supply chain and automotive. And it, it was bringing initially a lot of those ideas of, you know, why we, we believe that, you know, parametric, parametric insurance can actually work well for transport, right? And we should be branching out from the traditional, let's say, climate or weather uh, use cases of parametrics into something a little different and very differentiating. Uh, my second co-founder is Jeremy, my CTO. Uh, is He's a security and blockchain expert with obviously 12, 13 year 
uh, experience in, in web stack. So very much a full stack engineer, uh, very much established in the space. And he, he's been bringing a number of ideas in terms of how we can use uh, smart contract, DeFi, and other features of blockchain. So that was the core, um, you know, three guys, you know, working together in order to create a prototype, create a first product, and uh, get the investor, initial investor, excited about it. Um, the second stage has been to create, you know, more uh, engineers and more business people around us in order to start, you know, having more, um, you know, more strength in terms of operation, pricing, marketing, sales, but also brute force engineering. And that's been coming with a, a variety of channels. You know, it, it's been uh, thankfully from one of our partners, which is an agency uh, providers for contracts and engineers. Uh, Ubic has been helping us, you know, quite tremendously the first two years of our development, uh, sourcing, you know, talented engineers across the globe. Uh, but more recently, uh, a lot of um, you know, full-time hire uh, internally. Uh, on the back of our fresh capital that we just raised, uh, we opening four uh, new hires. So very excited to uh, to grow very very much faster, uh, you know, going forward. Uh, two of them are tech engineers that uh, we uh, essentially going third and fourth interview for right now. But, you know, if anyone is interested, you know, please reach out. Uh, so those two engineering roles are uh, lead full stack and senior data uh, because we are very big in data uh, these days. We, as we said, collecting data from logistics endpoint, from uh, IoT sensors, tracking devices in the transport is very important for us. And having like the full-blown ETL and modeling around it is extremely important for us. So that's two in engineering and two in on the business side. Uh, one is InsurTech sales. So we want a broker, uh, a sales specialist with client-facing experience join us for this uh, fantastic journey uh, with that we're continuing. Um, we want that person to have a lot of the grit uh, and experience in cargo, marine, or specialty insurance, but also a great willingness to actually jump on board in, into an innovation project such as us. And the uh, fourth hire is in operations management. So the while we claim that, you know, we automating, you know, 90%, 95% of most processes in terms of adjudication, administration, payments, pricing. Uh, there's always a need for strategic operations experts to open the book, look at, you know, any failure points of our uh, workflow diagram from clients to underwriters going through finance, ledger, accounting, um, any adjudication, administration, or even relationship with our partners and vendors, uh, mapping out the right workflow and processes into the operation management model is extremely important for us. Uh, so we met a number of very talent, talented actors in the space, but we continuing interviewing. So anyone's interested, please reach out. Oh, superb, yes. Um, the autonomy team is scaling. And um, if there is anyone out there interested to, to build the businesses of the future, Reach out to Yan. So one thing which um, resonated for me and actually crossed my mind as you were talking is you are in this decentralized world, which to my mind also means that as you scale autonomy, I assume you will be working with company potentially in the Lloyd's market. You will be working with companies in the United States. You will be working with companies in a number of markets. So how is it to build and grow a, comp uh, a team which will be decentralized, working potentially from different markets? Is that what is already happening with the team at Autonomy? That's correct. Um, you know, as as I mentioned, um, you know, some of the workforce that we managed to source uh, has been through an agency and they're good at, you know, finding talents in, in Europe, for instance. Uh, you know, the uh, competitive, uh, you know, pricing is, is one area, but also like a different vision that they bring to our uh, technology infrastructure is very important. So one of our talent data, database engineer is in Portugal, but we want to explore other areas. Um, as you said, Lloyd's is one of our partners in, uh, in many aspects. Uh, we spent three months 
you know, in London, you know, I was living in Mayfair, uh, going to the city every day uh, within the Lloyd's building because we spent, you know, three months within the court number eight of the Lloyd's lab. And that's when we, we met Sabine. So that was, you know, very happy event for many, many reasons. And, um, you know, we, we enjoyed a lot of the insurance expertise that we managed to, to gain over there, but is an extremely well and, and depth, depth of talents in terms of engineering, fintech experts on the London market. So certainly that's one of the areas that we continue exploring for, for, for new hires, certainly. Now, Having said that, you know, because we are by nature a distributed, you know, model, uh, we open to be on both sides of the pond, right? So we have uh, New York talents in the team. We have Boston uh, hires. We also have Denver, Colorado, but we open to other hubs that actually were created throughout the pandemic. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about, you know, Miami, Miami. Uh, which is a big, you know, tech hub now, San Luis, Atlanta, uh, Chicago, and I may forget others, but you know it's it's very you know very very encouraging to look at the uh, the nationwide and international uh, mapping of talents that we can actually source because now that you know there's less constraint about to be in person all the time, hundred percent. You know there's uh, many more opportunity to, to actually find you know some talents which are not constrained to actually pay the high rent for New York or San Francisco, Silicon Valley, but still, you know, are actually top, top notch players in the space. Yeah, that's, uh, that's so important, right? Um, to find the talent at the right price. And now we can all work remotely and we can still have a nice lifestyle, you know, potentially find the best way to remunerate and potentially look at um, different benefit package, let's say. One thing which crossed my mind is that you have an MGA license for autonomy, right? And so how does that play to make your business much more easy to deal with? Yeah, so just a, as a caveat slash disclaimer, uh, so the MGA license is provided by one of our partners uh, in the UK called Pro Global. Uh, so we, we are incubated within their platform for for the first stage of our licensing. Uh, now it's what's also true is uh, we uh, we have intent to um, get our own uh, MGA license in the US you know as soon as possible. So that's a that's a process that's gonna be starting you know in the next few months you know I keep you posted on the timing. Uh, but the general sense is um, you know those uh, MGA incubator are pretty good at getting you started and 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 you know getting you to start trading as soon as possible. But really, they they don't want you to stay on their platform too long. It doesn't make sense because you know they they're good at launching business, but when you are up and running, they want you to actually become autonomous and independent. This is exactly what our, our strategy is going to be. Um, the the second thing is you know an, a US MGA licensing uh, is extremely important. It's uh, pretty complicated to obtain. We have great legal teams going to be helping us on that perspective. Uh, but you know the holy grail for us is uh, obtaining a, a cover holder status eventually with Lloyd's, and and that's also a, a process that we are closely looking at. I think it's it's very important to stay very close to our uh, one of the most meaningful partners space, so the Lloyd's syndicates, and uh, to continue being in within their um, uh, ecosystem and having the cover holder st status eventually. Yeah, nice. Thank you for sharing. So here's my my last question for you. You know, what would be your last word of wisdom for people, you know, out there, you know, who are aiming to be inspired by the work you have done already and you are pushing along, um, but also for those looking for maybe finding new partners or, you know, talent coming to you, what would be your last word of wisdom for the people out there, you know, audience will include investors, um, I would call entrepreneurs, but really I call them corporate venturists, you know, the the, the the innovators we are working for corporations building CVCs but also uh, trying to work with companies like yours and you know your colleagues the young entrepreneurs yeah there's so many things I would like to bring up you know one of them is um, the fact that I rescued um, a dog this year and that was uh, a game changer in my life uh, so I, I recommend that people <laughs> consider it. Uh, but no, but more seriously, um, you know, I had, you know, 
pretty much the same conversation over the years uh, we saw in 2020, uh, you know, with a prototype, it was even an idea before a prototype and we had uh, a productionized product eventually. And then we started to have one traction from one reinsurance and that created more interest from other carrier. So the iterative process of um, essentially recognizing small wins and bootstrapping on this small wins to create the next win is what's very inspiring about being an entrepreneur overall. Um, and kind of the flip side of that conversation is, you know, is as corny as it sounds, but never give up, right? Um, there's a lot of entrepreneur that's going to have, you know, maybe good ideas or some funny, you know, app, you know, idea formation in their brain saying like, that's going to be the next billion dollar idea, whatnot. And beyond the three, four months, they gave up because they faced the first challenge. Um, I got to say, you know, I, I fell 99 times and and I stood up 100 times. So that's why I'm already standing right now. And that takes a lot of grit. That takes a lot of uh, belief. Uh, but, you know, anyone is capable of doing it, I believe. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Think focused, being really focused and uh and driven, and uh, you know, in the U.S., we 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 use often this term like hustler, or like being a hustler, right? Being able to actually stick with uh, one's commitments and just getting it done will be very very important. Well, Jan, thank you so much for joining us on Scouting for Growth. If people want to find you, where do they go? Yeah, so you can find us on our uh, website, uh, autonomy.ai, O-T-O-N-O-M-I dot ai or you can uh, send me an email directly uh yan y a double n at autonomy.ai and uh, i'll be sure to respond you know pretty quickly well thank you yan and i know i can find you as well on linkedin so you can check out yan as well on linkedin and the autonomy um page as well which tend to actually provide some of this inspiration around team atmosphere, current, you know, fundraise, some cool stuff going on on your LinkedIn page as well. So Jan, thank you very much for your time and I look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks a lot, Sabine. That was a pleasure. Talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Bye. If you like this podcast, subscribe now, share with your friends, and if you enjoyed it, please give it a five-star review. Also, if you want to cover any specific subject with me, contact me on Instagram under Sabine VDL Officials or LinkedIn under Sabine Van der Linden. Thank you.